So a little introduction about the readings we're about to hear. The first reading from Genesis, I'll warn you, is just, in my opinion, is just boring. <laughs> Sometimes it's the case when you read the Bible. But it won't be. It is, there's a choice in every parish of what's called track one or track two of picking the readings for, because they're all predetermined, but there are two tracks. And in track two, which is the one you used to use before I came here, track two takes the gospel and then goes through all of the Old Testament to find some reading that's like the gospel, to mirror it, to make an allegory. Track one, though, is, is the one I prefer. It picks a book and sticks with it for several weeks to get the fuller story. So this morning we get basically the boring opening credits to a You're waiting for the movie to start. And we're going to hear the story about Abraham, but these are the opening credits. When he's still old Abram, he hasn't been, had his name changed, etc. It's an important story that I think we need to know a little fuller than just a paragraph or two every three years. And so this week and next week and a few weeks following, we will continue that story. It may or may not have anything to do with what's in the gospel. Then the second reading, Dear, Dear St. Paul, never one of my favorite saints to have dinner with, but this morning he gets into what has been one of, again, the most boring theological debates the church has ever encountered. What's, it's kind of a egg argument. One that's never going to be really won. What's more important, the keeping the law and scripture and tradition faith. And it's not a debate I think has ever been successfully argued one way or the other. We need both. But if our accent's too much on one, we need it on the other. But when you're listening to it, the little backstory, just to help it not be quite so academic, is when he's talking about the law, he means Jewish people keeping the Torah. And when he's talking about faith, he is quite often talking about non-Jewish people. And the problem was in his early, early days of the church, Jesus was a rabbi, and he spoke to Jewish people. But after he died, a lot of non-Jewish people started wanting to get into Christianity. And at first, the apostles were like, well, you can't do that unless you become Jewish first. To become a Christian, you have to become Jewish. And as you can imagine, that wasn't a very popular approach <coughs> when, especially with the adult men who knew they have to get circumcised. So, but it's a bigger question of how much of our old tradition do you have to hang on to to get to this new tradition? So, but again, not one of the most exciting readings, but the gospel. As always, the gospel is just a treasure trove. The stuff that we're going to hear, any one of these parts would be worth a year of sermons. It's, a, it's about a lot of judging, exclusion, inclusion, which is kind of what Paul was almost getting to. But we start with the call of Matthew to the tax collector. The tax collector is, in that day, as you know, you've heard a million sermons on this probably, they were not popular. Whether you want to think they were like the Nazi guard, that the Jews would not want involved in their religion, or in modern day, you can think the alcoholic, the addict, the whoever it is, the person who is pretty much despised by all of society, Jesus is making an apostle. That ruffled some feathers. Then the, the clergy walk into the room and see Jesus at dinner with sinners and tax collectors. And they get into an uproar. 
that this is scandalous. And Jesus is going to show us the heart of our Christianity as it should be. He points out, I didn't come to call the self-righteous clergy and the super-religious people. I came to call the sick. They are the ones that need the physician. I've told you before, that's how I see our parish. This is not a place where perfect people are supposed to come and revel in each other's company. This is a hospital where we come in broken and flawed and a mess and ask God for grace and for help and for health. So the physician is calling the sick, not calling the healthy, as he's going to point out. Then he's going to tell us something I think we have to really chew on every week, but especially this week. He says, Look, listen, I want you to learn this. I require mercy, not sacrifice. Sacrifice is so complicated. It's a way of giving something to God. And quite often, if, how, do you, how do you physically give something to God? Well, part of it, one way is to destroy it so that I can no longer use it for myself. It's now in the spirit realm. Beautiful, lovely, it means to make something holy, to consecrate it, set it aside only for God's use, whatever that could be. And we should make these kind of sacrifices. We make these kind of sacrifices for our children, for our families, our friends. We should do them for God as well. It's a way of offering something out of love. But unfortunately, we start out well, but then we start twisting it that we start sacrificing animals, and we start sacrificing people and their reputations and all sorts of things that we sacrifice that suddenly have turned to hurting them, not us. It hurts to make a real sacrifice. For your children, you want to go on that fabulous trip to Hawaii, but your children need new school uniforms. So you sacrifice going you probably, hopefully, don't become a martyr over this. You probably want to not draw attention to it. But it's a way of silently offering something, making an ordinary thing holy for the benefit of somebody else. But as soon as that sacrifice turns to taking a price from the other person of killing them or hurting them or taking something away from them, that's not, that can't be what God's asking. A sacrifice from us, yes. A sacrifice from other people, no. Then take it that step further where he says, I really want you to learn this. And so we have to listen to it. I want mercy. Now mercy, again, is one of those words that we think we understand <coughs> until you start thinking about it. What is mercy? If I were to, I'm not one of those priests to point and say, tell me, what do you think? It'll put you on the spot. But ask yourself, as if I were about to, how would you define mercy? My understanding of it is I, I'm guilty of something, but someone in power lets me off the hook. That's mercy. Uh, I deserve, I get pulled over for speeding. I deserve a ticket. I was going too fast. But the policeman says, I'm going to let you go with a warning. That's mercy, clemency in the law. Not getting what we deserve. So that is an important concept. Part of it, though. Not getting what we deserve, but being let off the hook. And the second part of it is, we kind of have to go back to the Latin. In Latin, mercy is called misericordia, which, if you break the word down, is misery, suffering, of the heart, of the cardiac, the heart. So a suffering heart, 
is also mercy, that, which is the same thing as compassion. Compassion means to suffer with somebody. So again, this kind of mercy is a suffering of heart and a suffering with someone else and feeling their pain yourself. That also is mercy. And when you put the two together, the, person, the other person's suffering becomes your suffering. And not giving them what they deserve, but letting them off the hook. St. Thomas Aquinas said, of all the compliments we can pay to God, of all the attributes, all the things that we say, God is loving, God is kind, God is long-suffering, the most important thing we can say about God is that God is merciful. That isn't to put us down, but to put ourselves in the place of these tax collectors and sinners and the prostitutes, whoever Jesus is is having a great old dinner with, and I'm with him, that I would much rather be having dinner with that crowd than with the Pharisees, the clergy, the religious people. I, the same when everybody says, oh, I, I can't come to the church, you know, the roof would fall in. They're the ones we want. They're the fun ones. We want them to join. We don't need the self-righteous coming in here judging everybody. But this suffering with, this mercy that he says, listen, learn this. I don't want sacrifice, I want mercy. And does he show it? Is he modeling it? Because when we're talking about mercy, it's a little unclear. Are we talking about we want to get mercy or we want to give mercy? And the thing is, if we're going to be Christians, we have promised to model our lives to be just like Jesus. And does he show mercy? He's showing mercy to Matthew, the tax collector, an outcast, somebody in the margins everybody looks down on. He is sitting at a whole table full of the fun people that everybody else is judging as being bad or wicked. And certainly during Pride Month, that should come to mind, the people we used to label and put down, now telling them, no, we love you, and we want, to, we suffer with you, and we want to include you, that this is a safe place for the Latinos, the Browns, the Blacks, the Asians, anybody being marginalized, lifting them up because we suffer with them. The mercy that we want to show them, as much as we show mercy, we know we will get mercy. If we don't show mercy, then it's threatened we might not get mercy. And so we should learn this. All of these, where's Jesus showing mercy? One of the religious Pharisees walks into the room after judging everybody and kneels down in front of him and said, my daughter just died. Will you come heal her? I know you can do this. All of a sudden, the judgment got put aside, and he broke ranks and went into the party. The religious rabbi Pharisee that had just been judging goes in and kneels at his feet and says, I know you can do this. And Jesus shows mercy. He could have said, you were just saying that this crowd was sick and that they were all sinners and you know anything to do with them. Now all of a sudden you want me to go do something for you. Mercy. He says, of course, I will come. On the way, and this is where there's sermons inside of sermons here, and I'll try to keep this short. On the way out, one of my most favorite things in all the Gospels, he's going through the crowd and some poor woman who, it just says she'd had hemorrhaging all her life. So she would have been so ritually impure, cast off, don't go anywhere near this woman. She has this moment where she says, if I can just touch the hem of his robe, I know I can be healed. She doesn't ask him, she doesn't have any debate with rabbis, she just has this thing inside of her that says, I just have an intuition that if I could touch just even his clothing, I can be healed. And she is. In Mark's version, he 
kind of stops the crowd and says, whoa, hang on, who touched me? In a crowd. And the apostles are like, you're crazy. <laughs> what do you mean who touched you? Everybody is. But there was something different about it. That's what comes to mind. I know some of my colleagues don't do it, but going in every time we have church and kissing the altar, it's a symbol of Jesus that is supposed to be him. And going up and giving it a kiss, to me that is the touching of the hem. It's a thing of physical affection and connection. And it's important. It is something there that is a spark of divinity. And she's healed. And then Matthew's going to get back to the good story of he was on his way to remember to heal this girl who had died. And he goes in and he resurrects her. It's the first resurrection in this, this version of the gospel. She, was she in a coma? I don't know. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on that. But Jesus showed mercy. The Pharisee who had just judged, he deserved to be put in his place. But Jesus goes and does this. So in all this reading, Jesus is showing the importance of living by mercy rather than sacrifice. The other readings are basically going to do the same thing. That, that spark of faith, the element of grace, that it doesn't all depend on us, that God loves us first. And we need to take the mercy that's shown to us, where we don't get what we deserve. We get the most amazing, immortal life, knowledge of God, love, all the gifts, the graces that we're given. So let us listen attentively to what seem like boring readings, but actually are brimming with life and a whole philosophy of life for us. In the name of the Father the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.